Hello everybody, my name is Claire Beresford, I'm the CEO of Lawrence Simons and welcome to our latest edition of Summing Up. This is a podcast where we navigate fresh insights to help leaders in the legal industry prepare for and navigate these challenging times. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Chris Watson, who will be known to many of you watching and listening. Chris Watson is one of the world's leading communication law experts. He is a partner at CMS, an international law firm with 78 offices in 43 countries. Chris is a polyglot um, who speaks several European languages and thrives in cross-cultural environments where he lends his insights to clients and colleagues alike. Chris is an extremely well-regarded telecommunications lawyer who possesses considerable expertise in the field. He frequently provides commercial and regulatory advice to a varied client base, including telecoms companies, network operators and financial institutions. With more than 30 years experience, Chris is a past member of the Governing Council of the International Bar Association. He is chair of its Diversity Council. And Chris has been recognised in the Legal 500 Hall of Fame as one of the elite leading lawyers for telecommunications, as well as the Who's Who's Legal Thought Leaders Global Elite in 2020. That's quite the glowing introduction, Chris. Um, I'm I'm delighted to welcome you today. Thank you for for joining us. Um, And if I may, I'd like to sort of start at the beginning, if if I could, and just ask you a little bit about your childhood and growing up. Um, You know, what was what was home life for you like when you were growing up or your family life? Um, I spent my first seven years in Iran. I went there when I was two months old uh, because my father was working for effectively for the Shah down in the oil field. So I was brought up in a very hot, arid uh, unusual environment, let's say, um, and uh, particularly I was brought up by an Iranian uh, nanny, and uh, my first foreign language was Farsi, which the, the Persian language, uh, which I can, to my shock, I discovered I could still speak some of that. Uh, it's quite to the surprise of my the chap who, for unknown to me, had been the, my butcher for 20 years. He knew he was, but he didn't realise I could speak Iranian or Farsi back to him. So when he said that one of his colleagues had gone back home to Iran for a holiday and I completed my weekly meat order in Persian, he was completely flabbergasted. So I, I spent my first seven years in, in Iran um, and uh, my uh, I saw a lot of my mother, but she also... Uh, was teaching English to uh, various uh, communities out there uh, because the Armenians had a slightly difficult time in Iran and she took it upon herself to help them to uh, grow and uh, thrive and thought that one of the best ways she could do that was to teach them English. So she gave English classes to the uh, Armenians in Iran. Uh, She also uh, was the Iranian ladies' table tennis champion and a very fine... uh, (laughs) A very good uh, tennis player and also winner of the Abadan Bridge League on a regular basis. So she was, she was quite a uh, an operator and uh, I saw quite a bit of her though. I was actually brought up by, uh, and taught by an American lady called Lillian Goisick who was from New York who, who taught me English and other things until I was seven. Um, that's the We used to go around the, um, all the old ancient towns of Iran. I have a huge love of antiquity as a result, uh, but also of, of birds. Iran has an amazing bird life, and that formed my love of ornithology, birds, kingfishers especially, and eagles. Extraordinary. It's interesting, isn't it, that some of those things from childhood sow seeds that continue through through one's life path in a way that um yes it, it's fascinating so um i know from your uh from your company website and from from various other things that you studied modern languages at university um but but what made the trigger then to change from that to to law what what was that about uh, that was part of a, a slightly deeper seated plan in that i'd always intended to do law because i, I love working with words and language and that's what i'm best at but I knew that uh, if I really wanted to be successful in, in business and in life, I wasn't necessarily going to do it just by using languages. So I thought, well, where can you use languages in a, in a profitable way, to be frank? And, and the law seemed to be the obvious one. But I, I liked modern languages so much, and I was had the good fortune to be good at them without having to try too hard. I decided I'd keep doing what I was good at and found easy as long as I possibly could and then get the law. Right. So it was actually that I, I put off doing law as long as I possibly could and then I did it. 
Excellent. And so your career path then, um, and that makes perfect sense to do what you love first and, 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 and see how you can move into something that then can um, allow a career, mm. I suppose. Um, but was there something that when you were talking about how you had the love of words and how you can use words in the law, was there something that was a catalyst for how then you connected those dots, right? You were you were a linguist, you loved language. Mm. What was the what was the leap then? Because you're a linguist, you love language, you could have gone and been a professor at a university, or wasn't that quite at the at the um, ambition level, if I may put it that way? It's a great question. You're right to probe. Um, in fact, it was when we joined the EU, uh, because at that point I realised that the, the, the being able to speak these various languages was actually suddenly really useful. And that uh, if uh, I've always reckoned that if you can do something that other people can't, then it's probably best to try and do that. And the EU made me realise that there was a whole new world there for us. And yeah. that I, I died. by that stage, I had got Spanish, French, German and Russian, plus Farsi, which uh, doesn't really help in this context. Uh, and I, I realised that I was pretty well placed with that lot to uh, cover a lot of the EU and that effectively the EU law and doing that was an area where I could put my love of words into this new environment because the other thing, apart from sticking to what you're good at and doing what other people can't do, uh, the other thing that is, is helpful is, is to identify um, areas where you can connect people and, and that's the other thing that I like doing. And so all, all of it seemed to me a big project in connecting people and that, it, that I wanted to be an EU lawyer. Mm. Fascinating. Um, I also, well, uh, I also have a love of languages, although ne not nearly at your uh, prestigious <laughs> level. And I, I had the opportunity to do my master's degree um, in European law in in Gosh. Belgium. Uh, and I, yeah, yeah, and I did. Uh, I lived and worked there for over ten years. So I am equally. I, I, I don't know if this is going to make the podcast, but I'm an equal lover of um, European law and just that ability to see that a German lawyer's sort of training ground and how they get there and that that um, logic may be slightly different to an English mm -hmm. lawyer's, but ultimately there's a there's a a wonderful. Um, ability to uh, able to be arriving at, a, at the same point even though sometimes that thought process may be a different one and I think that's what's fascinating about how what you can learn from other people and other cultures um yes very very interesting very very interesting Chris um we're we're particularly passionate at, at Lawrence Simons about how we can ensure that talent remains in the legal sector how what what companies and law firms are doing to nurture and and um ensure that that talent can thrive um and typically what we know is that people who are in uh, senior uh, uh leadership positions within within their firms and organizations have often had the opportunity to have mentorship or sponsorship throughout their their career or, or somebody that was was the difference that made the difference yep. Have you had any mentors that have had a particular impact on your career? Yes, including uh, really quite recently. Um, I, I was recruited to CMS by a lady called Isabel Davis, who mentored me through my first few years there and who decided that we at, at, at CMS at the time, they had, they had media and they had technology, but they didn't have communications or telecommunications. And so she said, right, we're going to go and find someone. And so she got me, brought me on board, got me through the board, got me appointed as a partner, um, did just just took on this quite challenging project, and and I owe her so much for having taken that on um, some well fifteen years ago now, fourteen years ago now, and since then I've had the good fortune also to be supported and mentored by our senior partner Penelope Warren, who you may have come across, who has also been a great yeah. supporter for me. So that's that's quite um, recent. Um, I have another life which is that I'm a wine grower in Burgundy and I've become one of the elders of the village of Chablis through the efforts of my Burgundy godmother who decided that the Brotherhood of Chablis uh, needed on its top board, there are 24 of us, um, a, a more refreshing voice who might encourage them to include some women in the chapter. 
And she decided this was most likely to happen if it was an, an outsider, because most of them are f- French men from Chablis. And she, right. she therefore sponsored me and put me forward. So I've become one of the elders of Chablis. And we are indeed now going to have uh, three women elected to the chapter in the next round. So I've delivered for her. But she sponsored me in, in that, which is also a very important part of my life. That's extraordinary. I mean, we are going to talk about gender and diversity and male allyship <laughs> and, and all of those things that I know that you are um, particularly uh, keen to ensure that 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 those subjects are discussed, explored, um, uh, debated and encouraged. Um, throughout your career then, have you noticed a change in improvements when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion? Broader than legal, specific to legal, how would you, how would you be able to, to summarise that? At, at a very minimum, there is awareness of it and it goes right across. And even those who don't completely get it are pretty much all aware that they ought to. So that, that I think, is what has really changed. Right. Whether everybody gets it or whether everybody, while feeling they ought to, actually does it, I'm not so sure. I think there's still a lot of work to be done, and I think it needs to be done every day by everybody. But uh, there, that has been a really major change. And I am happy at a firm where my senior partner is a woman, the two bosses of my department are women. In the last board election, we elected four new board members to the board of the firm, and all four of them were women. And yet that was done by a group which, of which men was 55%. So I think that if you look at the environment I have chosen to land in and settle in, I realise that I have found one which is genuinely quite inclusive. And that, that, that I didn't realise it at the time. It's only looking back on it as sometimes these things do happen that I realise that. But I am comfortable with that. And I have to say that, you know, life is never always simple in a partnership, but that um, the partners I find most collaborative and constructive generally are often the women there. Interesting. Interesting. And that's wonderful to hear. And I am... Doffing my um, virtual cap, CMS. That's that's a great testament to, to your to your law firm. And um, it's not quite um, that across the board. I would say uh, we we know that from our lived experience at, at Lawrence oh, yeah. Simons. So, what, one of the things that I think is is really vital, um, and it is something that's often overlooked when we when we speak about diversity, equity, and inclusion, is the role of the male voice. Is the role of the white male voice is the role of male allyship in the legal industry. Mm. What, what, what does that mean for you, Chris? Two things. One is that recognising the help that I've had at various times from various people, including the, the three wonderful women I've mentioned, I seek to mentor and sponsor really talented women, prospective partners, and uh, I've now, I'm proud that three of those who I've mentored and sponsored have become partners. One of them is now the boss of my group, um, Emma Burnett. Uh, Jackie Valla has just become a, uh, a partner in the competition team. And Chitan has, is now leading our digital infrastructure finance piece. Uh, and I have had a significant, I'm delighted to have had a really significant part in their promotion uh, and Valentina Sant'Ambrogio, I actually was one of those who put her up for partnership, even though she's in a different department from me, because we work very closely on a lot of M&A in the communication space. So I've, I have tried to make sure that when the call goes around for support, I'm there to support. But also, that bef- long before that happened, I've been working with them, trying to make sure that they understand the process they're involved in and the direction they're traveling and the progress they're making and that they are able to tick the boxes that need to be ticked because you are look, mm. looking at it from my end of the telescope which is uh, much older you can see the boxes that need to be ticked and you can help people right. to do that whereas if they just had to paddle away on their own they wouldn't necessarily see that or would make it much more uh, difficult and slow process it's curious isn't it that there are things that are eminently obvious when you're at the other side of it. It's it's some of those 
sort of unseen gates that one has to pass through that unless somebody's telling you this is something that you need to think about it, it, it isn't as obvious as um uh, as it may seem to all particularly those that haven't had a, a sort of broader um um experience of navigating some of those um uh how can i frame this some of those uh career hurdles that one has in any in any walk of life right legal is no different to, to other sectors right. in that what i'm curious to sort of um to understand chris is you know one of the things that 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 we are very clear about is that you know talent mm-hmm. is talent and we have to be able to nurture all talent and look at talent there is to us a difference we see it every day between that um, and I'm making some gross generalizations here I'm, I'm very aware of that but there's a there's a natural propensity for um, uh, young lawyers um, who are confident and able and um, who are looking at job descriptions going yeah I'll put my hand up for that and others that, that don't um, and because we know that more women join the profession than men Yep. Right, that's the stat currently. Yet in the upper echelons, for all kinds of reasons, uh, that doesn't translate. Mm. So uh, law firms, in particular, have a p- pretty bad press when it comes to how do they retain that talent when parenthood starts. Mm. Right, when parenthood starts, and and um, you know women opt out. H- how do they? How do they sort of keep them? So there's, to me, there's part of that male allyship as well that is looking around. What does parenthood mean? How are we able to to talk about this where we are taking that share, mm-hmm. taking that mm-hmm. load? And um, so, have, do you have any thoughts or comments in in that regard? Certainly, when I look at all the, uh, the there are two or three younger women lawyers in CMS with whom I'm working at the moment. I mean, uh, the the four, the five I've mentioned who I've, I've supported. Uh, all of them have children. I've had children through that process. And I've got mm-hmm. three others who I'm working with and supporting who, um, who are, have, have children or are having children. And one of the things I think you can do when, you, when you're in my position is to manage the clients and to right. make it clear that there is no expectation that people will be there 24-7 or all, the, all over the weekend. And as the person who's on the spot and talking to the client... The poor victim doesn't always have the ability to say, I'm not going to do that. Whereas being much older and being the client relationship partner, I can say that. And so I will very often find I step in and say, well, we'll be able to do that by probably Tuesday next week, thus giving time for for, the the balancing of work and Mm -hmm. and home life, which all of us have to do, but especially women with younger children have to to do a lot. Uh, And you can create space for people, which they may, may find it more difficult to create for themselves. I, I think that's a, a very important role, which it's more or less impossible to do on your own. Yeah. It, it's that ability as a senior leader to be able to support and hold that space, isn't it? That you, you're saying, I've got the client relationship, I will manage those expectations. Um, and, and those those um, people in your team then understand that you truly are helping them and supporting them and, and that it's okay to have that work-life flow um, and that sometimes a child's ill um, and, and you know, parents will need to yeah. take this time off. I've, I feel very passionately that it's, we need to start, you, you have a love of words and a love of language and, and it's, it's incumbent upon us all really to start talking about parenthood, yeah. right? It's not motherhood. It's, you know, um, uh, I, I grew up in a time when my father, God bless him, um, you know, it was a different it was a different type of world. Yeah. Right. And he wasn't expected to do some of the things now that that, you know, my husband does or, or that or that others do. Um, and equally, I think it's really important for young male lawyers to know that they have that opportunity mm-hmm. to that it isn't it isn't that they can't also have those um, those abilities to to say you know I'm, I'm at home with the kids and I need yeah. some time. I, I think yeah. that 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 is true equity, equality, and inclusion when we're talking about how we're able to to, to balance that out. You've reminded me of a time actually when it was really important to me to be able to be out of the office every second Friday 
from about 11 in the morning to be with my children. And my partners at the time um, allowed and encouraged and supported that. And that allowed me to continue to have a, a good and close relationship with my children. So I, I, you're speaking directly to my personal experience there, Claire. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, and again, it's what we seek to do in these in these summing up episodes is to draw those threads, right? It's to, to be able to say, here's somebody who has been, is very successful in what they do, who is who is a leading light in, in this particular practice area of the law, and yet, right? And yet, X years ago, they were able to have you know, time to to look after their children or to 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 work more flexibly. Um, is there any pe- sorry? Another Chris, example of that. Ahead. One of my children was quite ill three years ago, and my senior partner and my managing partner um, Penelope and uh, Stephen um, hear, heard about it on the grapevine, took me aside and said, "Right, take two and a half months off. Go and do what you need to do." I didn't even need to ask them. Mm. Wonderful culture, wonderful culture. It, it, it's interesting, isn't it, that when one gets to a certain sort of period of one's life, you've got that confidence really to be able to to um, to share some, some of these things. And hmm. advice uh, can be taken or it, it, can, it, it can be left. But do you have any particular piece of advice that you could give to aspiring lawyers? I would, the one I always think is, is, is it, it sounds like a, a guide to idleness but it's do stick to what you're really good at you know if if there's something you can do that you find easy that other people find difficult that is very often a path which leads to happiness and to success but also do something that other people don't do i remember at a very early stage for odd reasons i got to be quite well informed about the law of lotteries and because it's quite a sizable firm, it was remarkable how many bits of work came my way because I was the chap who knew about lotteries. I was only one year qualified. But I knew about this weird thing, and that just attracted interest and the opportunity to show what I could do. And so mm-hmm. it, if you can master something that other people don't know so much about, um, it'll give you confidence as well because you know, even if it's only a little bit, you know more than other people, and they come to you. And you have the through that you get the ability to grow what you know because you keep getting asked the questions that keep taking you forward, and this is how, in the end, you build a specialisation. Mm. Yeah, and your specialisation is a is an is an interesting one. And, and if I can change gears a bit, if I may, and just ask you sort of about your role at, at CMS and um, and sort of what it is that you do, would you be able to sort of encapsulate that in a few sentences? I bring together competition and EU law, commercial law and technology. I do that because I started as a competition lawyer at at Simmons & Simmons under the great Peter Freeman, who who has gone on to be uh, an absolutely stellar EU and competition lawyer, and he taught me an awful lot and gave me space. Uh, And they sent me to France to open the Simmons & Simmons Paris office with a French avocat, and I requalified in France. Uh, as a barrister, I'm still an avocat at the à la Cour in Paris. And while I was there, I was asked to work on the channel tunnel radio and signaling links and telephone links, which had to be done in English and in French because this was the channel tunnel. And I worked a lot for GPT, which was installing equipment in France. And so I was doing a huge amount of basic communications technology commercial work in two languages. And because I could do that and other people couldn't do it in both, I got asked a lot of really quite challenging, difficult and interesting stuff. A lot of it around state aids and state procurement and the sorts of things that you will know from your time at Louvain. And that, again, meant that I had a special knowledge in these areas, which other people didn't have. And just I built on that um, to advise now. I advise governments, the World Bank. I've written laws in Lebanon and Jordan. And I, I do I work with major telcos. But it's all built on that bedrock of the knowledge I got when I was first working in France in 1990. Extraordinary. It's extraordinary that, um, and that all came from your love of languages. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, 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 so your advice about do what you like, do what you love, 
find a niche where you may have some knowledge that somebody else doesn't has allowed that that to happen um you mentioned earlier um right at the start about your mother who's who's sounds to um, have been quite the role model in terms of teaching English to some of the Armenians in Iran. And, and, and I wonder if that is perhaps where some of your charitable work stems uh, from. I, I know in doing some research ahead of this podcast, you, you have various charitable organisations that, that you work with. Um, mm. How do you balance that with your work as the partner at CMS and, and some of the other engagements on your time? I try to act as if it isn't there. I do my day job. Uh, I cover the day job basis, but I feel it's a bit like it's something between a balanced diet and, and plenty of fresh air in the sense that you need to be getting positive uh, affirmation from a range of sources in order to be a whole person. And so I decided quite early on that I wanted to do um, you know, pro bono and things, and I, I wanted to balance it. And so I've tried to have one environmental charity, one social uh, charity, and one scientific. And at the moment, there isn't a scientific one, but for quite a while, I was chairman of a thing called Centre of the Cell, which is the outreach part of Queen Mary University in London, which does a lot of work in East London for the... Um, uh, particularly the, 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 the Tower Hamlets and Hackney and popular communities. Uh, and it's it's the same thing as we were talking about. Once you get to be a, a, a certain age or have seen a certain amount of things, you can make a contribution just by, without really having to work awfully hard, but just by knowing what you know. It's like a, a really good footballer that's to take a current question who knows that you don't have to hair around all the pitch like uh, all over the pitch like a madman if you stand in the right place you can generally make the tackle and so that's the um that's what the sort of the, the experience and knowledge give you is the ability to do more with less effort mm, absolutely and and equally i think that's also how that um how those client relationships where you have that confidence to be able to say, we'll deliver this work to you, or, you know, two days later or to manage those expectations come from an understanding of how you're able to, you're able to see a little bit further ahead in the road and understand perhaps what those bumps um, are going to look like. Uh, because I think one of the things that in, in law firms that, 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 that great partners are able to do is true partnership. Um, and I think it's often overlooked sometimes that why are you call partners, right? Why aren't you called oh. executive vice president or, you know, senior vice, you know, senior president? It's, you're called partners because, yep. and, the, you know, I'm not sure that I can do the etymology of the world, uh, the, the word, which I'm sure you could. Um, it, from, from that ability to understand what that partnership looks like with your clients. Um, yeah. And do you think if you if you were able to sort of go back to some of those key learnings from your career, when were you able to step into that partnership um, confidently, Chris? When you know we often see when junior partners are made up that there's still a there's still a skills or a knowledge gap or 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 they're looking to their peers for, for support. When mm -hmm. did you when did you feel that you um, were able to have that true partnership with your clients? When I went to France, I was four and a half years qualified when I went to France. And I, at that stage, Simmons and Simmons in London were doing some amazing work for really important clients. And uh, I was, because I was able to speak French and to deal with the French law piece, I was able to speak with the very top people. I don't know if all of those listening will remember the insolvency of the BCCI, uh, oh, yes. which was owned by the um, Abu Dhabi government. But it was in huge amounts of money, $8 billion, which was a lot of money in those days, was embezzled. And um, the Abu Dhabi government said, OK, well, we, we will stand behind the debts of this bank, um, although we didn't embezzle the money, but we will stand behind the debts. But... And, 
as soon as that was said, then there's a sort of feeding frenzy with every regulator in the world trying to get all, all the money they could out of them. And I was asked to, to represent the Abu Dhabi government against the Bank of France in French, uh, including going to court. And I had senior ministers and, and members of the Abu Dhabi royal family sitting in my office with me interpreting for them to the Bank of France and the French Ministry of Finance. And um, I had to do this with a member, with one of my London partners sitting in, but he didn't really speak the French. Mm -hmm. So I grew up extremely quickly because I had to do, I remember this as being actually the most exhausting, tiring, challenging thing I did, two, three-hour sessions, translating from the Abu Dhabi uh, minister uh, into French and the Bank of France back into English for the Abu Dhabi minister while negotiating for them at the same time. Extraordinary. Um, that stretched me to absolutely to my limits, but gave me great confidence. Mm -hmm. And it also reminded me of the importance, or it taught me so much about the importance of how you express things in one language across to a different culture. And I don't think I could have done that without having been brought up in Iran. Because mm -hmm. I was actually doing three cultures there. Yeah, indeed, indeed. It's fascinating, um, Chris, when we when we sort of unpick your career, because as I mentioned in the introduction, you've also very been very active in the International Bar Association, um, mm. and you you're currently on the Diversity and Inclusion Council. Um, are there any initiatives there that you would like to share with the, the listenership, the uh, the viewership of, of this podcast, in terms of what you've been involved with? I would love to. We've been we've been quite active, and I'm very proud of it. Um, the first thing is I'm participating in the review of the constitution of the IBA, which was written several decades ago, uh, at a time when, as we observed, the, these ideas of diversity and inclusion were not completely current. And it also covers the whole of the world, which includes a lot of different cultures and, um, and regions. And therefore, it, it, it's quite a challenging piece of work to draft something which will work for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a number of projects there which are designed to give a toolkit for everybody involved in the legal profession, um, every, all members of all bars, so that if they wish to make progress in the way of diversity and inclusion, they will have the resources that they need. So we've got, well, we've, we've got principles, we've got um, a... Uh, a toolkit of training, so um, you can online diversity and inclusion training, to with modules to approach different things, so that you can raise your awareness and understand better what it is that you're doing and how it affects other people. Um, we've got uh, a as a model constitution for smaller law firms. The bigger law firms, we assume, can look after themselves, but the smaller ones don't necessarily have the resources or the time, and it can cost a lot of money to get a specialist to do those things. Um, we've worked on policy documents, bullying, harassment, um, those kinds of things. We have um, arranged that every committee on the IBA has a diversity and inclusion officer who is whose role is to ensure that um, every event that takes place and every officer who's appointed and every um, document that they put out has been prepared with a suitable degree of thought for uh respecting the diversity and inclusion of the reader and the author. Um, and um, we make sure also that we structure what the, IBA the, what the IBA does is structured generally with regard to diversity and to inclusion. So we're, we're seeking to do all that we can and also to ensure that the members of the IBA, we attract a diverse membership because mm -hmm. if you don't attract a diverse membership at the bottom, you'll never get a, diver you'll never get a diverse outcome at the top yeah. without really bending it out of shape. And we don't want, I don't want ever to be bending things out of shape to achieve what we want to achieve. Fantastic. How long do you think it's going to take to roll that out across the IBA? Um, we, th I think by next year's annual conference, all of these elements will be in place. Um, how quickly then bars and the member individuals and the member law firms will fully implement them and adopt them, I don't know, because it's a voluntary organisation. Yeah. We have to convince 
and win hearts and minds. We cannot drive, we cannot compel. Mm -hmm. If you do that with volunteers or indeed people who are paying to be a member, then they just vote with their feet. Yeah. So we need to proceed in a firm and clear but respectful way with what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, understood. I get a sense that there has been a... There are things that have come from a post-pandemic world where we have seen um, m things move progress much more quickly um, than we did in a, in a pre-pandemic world. That the most obvious answer to that is um, flexible working arrangements. Um, when everybody had to had to work from home and, and technology right. enabled that, uh, suddenly across all kinds of companies and organisations we have the ability to work from home and uh, X days a week or however that works for that organisation. And yeah. equally, I think what we have seen in um, the DEI space is that there's been some great leaps ahead in terms of, yeah. of what what companies and other, other organisations are doing. Mm -hmm. um, given your background and given your sort of uh, uh, expertise in all things... Uh, digital communications technology, uh, I'll make it as broad as I possibly can. Yeah. Are you seeing any themes in a post-pandemic era that, that your your clients are finding particularly tricky or, or challenging, Chris? That's not the question I thought you were going to ask. Um, <laughs> I, I think that a theme is that actually the pandemic has reminded people of how important it is that you have human contact and that availability and being in the office actually at certain times are very important and that to, uh, to build teams and to get a sense of, of what people are doing, it's important to be in the office. And in particular, if you want to be sensitive to people's situations, Mm -hmm. That information tends to get lost in remote working. And that, for example, if somebody in the office is having a difficult time or their child is having a difficult time, that information is almost impossible to get hold of when they're working from home. Mm. Whereas when they're in the office, they may share it with somebody and somebody will have a quiet word with somebody else. And you get this sort of soft network of communication, which can be very supportive. And I think that is a missing element from remote working and that people got isolated and that that degree of insight into people's positions and personal situations is really important if you want to help and support them. Mm. I agree. What was the question that you thought I was going to ask? Um, did I feel that remote working had actually been um, support assi of assistance in relation to inclusivity and diversity? And I was going to quote my favourite New Yorker cartoon, which is a dog sitting at a desk like I am with a mouse saying, of course, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. <laughs> it's, it, that, that's interesting. And it, it is actually one of the, the themes that we're looking at as a, as a sector and as a, as a business, because there's some quite... Um, horrific data that's come out of McKinsey recently uh, from the US, broader than legal, let me be very clear on this, this is, you know, yeah. in sectors um, where there is an exodus of women um, in Korea mm -hmm. and there's a particular exodus of women of colour um, and that in certain situations for some of those promotion routes, it is now back to if you are in the office, you are more visible and therefore, and the, the data from McKinsey seems to be showing that there is a gender difference there, that, that men have gone back to the mm. office and many of the women have stayed at home. I don't, I don't know if you want to comment on that in any way. I suppose it would only be speculation, but... 50 years ago or more, it was expected that, like my mother, you, you would be at home when your children were at home. And the, 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 the trajectory since then has been away from that expectation, from that normality. And that during lockdown, it sort of reset itself slightly. It did. It did. 
No. And, and, and I, I, if we may, on some of the positive, because I don't just want to dwell on negatives, you know, one of the things yeah. that, that I can speak to personally is there was something very joy-filled being able to sit down at an early time to have um, food as a family, you know, oh. that, that wasn't staggered. And, Absolutely. and so I would work my, I would work my, and this comes to what we're talking about in terms of leadership, right? And that leadership, and I would say to my team, it's five o'clock. I, I will come back online later, but at five o'clock, we are all sitting down as a family and we're going to eat together. I'm from Brilliant. the north. It's traditionally called tea. See? We're going to have tea and then yep. the kids can go do what they need to do. And if I need to get back online. And so I think there are right. things that one hopes that you can hold on to from a, um, some of the good things that came out of home working yep. and, and the pandemic. Yeah. Um, so, Chris, not not that in any way your career is over. I don't want to set hairs <laughs> racing here, but um, is, there, that. is there is there anything that you um, are sort of looking at currently? What's next for you, or are, are there any un, undertaking any exciting projects? I've I've always got various things on the go. I've, I've got my vineyards. Um, I've got um, some contacts in the Far East who'd like me to do things there with them. I'm working with a very, very interesting uh, bunch of people called the Group of Humans, uh, where I think there's enormous potential. And um, one thing we haven't really talked about is, is that one of the reasons I'm involved in the IPA and while I'm, why I'm the leader of my, my uh, group at CMS is because is I love putting people together, making connections and, and effectively supporting and allowing communication among people not just with you know, telecoms networks, just seeing each other and meeting people who have possibly something which is of interest and use to them. And I, I love doing that. And increasingly, I find that even as a lawyer, what I'm doing is uh, somebody comes to me saying, oh, we've got this problem. And I said, well, have you thought about not law X, but person X? Mm. And uh, so uh, bringing a, a, a wider range of solutions than just the law mm. to what I do. And I love doing that. And I've got, you know, by, by this stage and having been as many places as I have been, I've got a very wide address book. And so I, I just love th thinking about who, who, how could X help Y and how can these things work together? And I do that both in the, the charitable sector and with, with work and with my family and, and with the IBA. So it's, net, it's, it's networking. I'm a networking person. You're a natural recruiter, Chris. This is what we do in our <laughs> sector. Um, okay. Connect oh. people. Um, yeah. Some of my team often say, if we weren't doing this, we think that we would be offering sort of marriage services for like, you know, uh, some, some arranged marriage. Uh, so true, because you, you were talking about the importance of partnership earlier. And it, it, I think that the essence of partnership is people really understanding each other as it is of marriages. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And understanding that even though we may bring our pleasing personalities to work, it is also very important that we bring our pleasing personalities to home too. It is yes. it is that whole whole person. So bring your whole self to Please go ahead. Bring your whole self to work. Yes. And yeah. and that is also one of the things that I think has come from a post pandemic environment. When people yeah. were looking into your home quite literally at the beginning before we all worked out how to do those things to, you know, people were literally going, oh, gosh, yes, look, oh, those books look interesting. And, yeah. and, and one's authentic self couldn't help to be there. And I think that there's come a tolerance now, particularly within legal, I think, mm -hmm. that um, when we see it with our clients, that, you know, it's fine if World War Three is going off next door because the children are, you know, having a, an interesting yeah. time. Everybody, everybody's been there. Everybody understands it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I, I think I there is an authenticity that, that the legal profession has. has to be authentic. Yeah. Home, isn't it? yeah. That's truly embraced. Yes. So I was, I was summing up really, Chris, to say thank you so much for your time. Um, we have a final question as part of our podcast, which we ask all yeah. of our guests. And that is, what's the one thing that you can't live without? Wine. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. Listen to music, but wine. <laughs> I, I'm a wine grower and I adore it. Oh, how, how wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Chris. I have thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. And for all of those that have um, watched this, please do leave us any comments that you would like to know about and stay tuned for our next episode.
Thank you so much. Thank you.